Welcome to Magic Arcanum, I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Letson, and we are so glad you're here because it's story time. Today we're trying something new, you know, you gotta mix it up once in a while, keep things fresh. So I am attempting to rank all 31 legendary elemental creatures by lore. And what does that mean exactly? Well, I have created four categories that I can use to score every legendary creature in Magic, and I will start with the elementals. Each card will be given a score from 1 to 10 in the following four categories. L is for legendary. Does this creature deserve to have a legendary card? There are a lot of named characters in the Magic story, but are all legends legendary? The Khans of Tarkir would score well here, for example. They are important people on their plane, they appear multiple times throughout the story, and interact directly with the Planeswalkers. Whereas, a character like Campbell would not be missed on Kaladesh. O is for Otherworldly. The multiverse is populated with heroes and villains of all sorts, but the best ones have something about them that is uniquely magic. A Gold Hoarding Dragon would fit in in a lot of different generic fantasy tales, and while it's fun to see those tropes show up in Magic, I'm looking for legendary characters who offer something truly extraordinary. R is for Reflection. Does the card reflect what the character accomplishes in the story? Does it capture their skills and abilities? Does playing the card feel like you are interacting with that character in a meaningful way? Josu Vess would earn top marks. He was a zombie knight who fought for the Cabal, and he was a real menace until his sister Liliana laid him to rest. He also commanded a giant army of other zombies, so his card is a perfect reflection of what it would be like to face him in battle. And E is for extra. While the other categories can all be supported by looking at the cards or the stories, I wanted a way to put my thumb on the scale a bit and help the truly special characters stand out as well. So with all of that in mind, I am now going to rank the 31 Legendary Elementals by lore score from lowest to highest. Here we go. In 31st place with just 16 points, we have Paco Arcane Retriever. We don't know what plane he's from, we don't know who he's interacted with beyond his own partner, and his design feels more dog than it does elemental. I'm sorry if this one was your favorite. Somebody has to be the worst elemental, and for me, it's this mutt of a magic card. Marith, Will of the Wilds, next in 30th place. Marith, introduced in Commander 2013, comes from an unknown plane and has no connection to anyone of note. The only interesting thing here with this one is that it received an errata so that the ability could not use X equaling zero, otherwise you could make an infinite number of zero zero creature tokens. And if you had something on the battlefield watching creatures enter the battlefield or dying, then you would have infinite triggers. And we can't have that! Thrix, the Sudden Storm, is next. He's got some connection to Thassa based on his flavor text, but he never appeared in the Theros story, not that there was much of one this time around. His powers also do not feel very storm-like to me, so 29th place. And we have another low-pressure system entering the region with Vadrock Apex of Thunder. Now, spoiler, none of the Apex legends from Ikoria scored very well because they didn't appear in the story at all, and their abilities don't really match the little bit of lore that was supplied by Vivian's field guide for the plane. For example, all Vivian says about Vadrock is that he has a long hunting route, and somehow that translates to him caring about cheap non-creature spells. I should mention a lot of the scores are going to end up tied, and so I let Nicole serve as the tiebreaker. If you have a problem with that, you should join our Patreon, get access to our exclusive Discord, and then send Nicole a direct message using our official Magic Arcanum Angry Goose emoji. Anyway, Maelstrom Wanderer is our next legendary elemental, and this one we know is from Alara, born out of the Maelstrom Nexus at the center of the Conflux when the five shards of the plane reconverged. The Wanderer 
No, not that one. Still wanders the unfamiliar terrain imbued with the chaotic energies of the Maelstrom. His double cascade mechanic is a direct reference to the Nexus, so he gets a good reflection score, but he just never had anything meaningful to do with the story. Which is the same problem that plagues Brokos, the next apex creature from Ikoria. He also had nothing to do with the story, and his mythos says that he's not very nightmarish either, so his card doesn't really seem to reflect what little we do know about him per that piece of lore. He is definitely magical though, giving him a decent otherworldly score, and his unique use of mutate gives him just enough extra spice to land in 26th place. Calamax is our third legend created for a commander product, and you'll see I usually give those a score of 5 for legendary because they don't usually have anything to do with the ongoing story, but they do at least get their own write-up telling us something about them. In the case of Calamax, we're told he's from Ikoria, and that his mood changes with the weather, and the weather changes with his mood, which is neat, but I don't see that reflected on his card, which cares about instant spells. And the weather in Magic has been represented by enchantments, and even sorceries. Now, I've got Adamar in 24th place, and I suspect this is where I'm going to start getting some passionate disagreements from people down in the comments, which is fine, because I love engagement just as much as the YouTube algorithm does. We do not know what plane Adamar is from. You're going to tell me it's Zendikar or maybe Alara, but that's never been officially confirmed anywhere. And while the card itself is quite powerful, it is a living landscape that cares about creatures instead of lands, which to me just doesn't feel right. We've got our first companion with Jengatha next at 23rd place. The companions scored a little better than the Apex monsters because I think Vivian's field guide notes were better written for those guys, plus they had an undeniable impact on magic as a game until their rules were changed. Since, you know, you and I are planeswalkers while we're playing Magic. And these things definitely had an impact on all of us for like six weeks. Up next is Phylath World Sculptor, which is a bit of a wild card because they are new as of Zendikar Rising. And all we know about them so far is that they tend to a small garden deep within Marasa. The abilities do feel very Zendikar, though, and they put the plane's signature landfall mechanic to good effect, making this elemental feel like it's more about creation than destruction. And that brings us to Zidra, another elemental companion from Ikoria. Vivian's field notes refer to this one as having fur that feels like a perfectly warm sunbeam, which I guess somehow makes all of your activated abilities a little bit easier to fire off. Somehow. Starting off our top 20 is Aluna Apex of Wishes. This is the highest scoring Apex monster from Ikoria. For the same 5 mana you paid to get Brokos, you still get a 6-6 with Trample, but you also add Flying. And Magic has a history of using Dreams and Wishes to represent playing cards off the top of your deck. I like this card, and I wish I could have ranked it higher, but the lack of participation in the Ikoria story hurts, and Vivian's field guide notes don't really gel with what's in the text box. So, it is what it is. 19th place goes to Ur Drago, I believe Magic's first legendary elemental, and he was a small threat on Dominaria for a while. He's got hands and feet like scorpion pinchers, which unfortunately we cannot see in the card art, and he doesn't need to eat or breathe, only to kill. So this guy is basically Darth Vader plus The Rock from that third Mummy movie, but he's only a 4-4 four four for like 100 mana, and that's why he's not higher on my list. Silvos Rogue Elemental is next. He was created by the Mirari and found purpose in life in the Fighting Pits, where his regenerating and trampling really fit in. He's pretty otherworldly too, but without a better connection to the main story, his legendary score suffers. We have another new Zendikar Rising card in 17th place, and that's Yasharn. It looks like they won't be appearing in the story, but we do get some flavor text which helps make sense of these abilities. Yasharn is helping Zendikar rebuild after surviving the Eldrazi, and fetching forests and plains out of your deck is a great way to show life flourishing in those footsteps. Big flavor win there! 
Lutri the Spell Chaser is next, a companion so powerful he was banned in Commander, like immediately. Vivian's notes tell us that he managed to activate one of her magical arrows, and I could see how a fleeting fascination with a variety of shiny objects could be represented by requiring differently named cards in your deck. So overall, this otter scores pretty well. The only thing holding him back is the same problem as everybody else on Ikoria. No meaningful story presence. Our next entry fares a little better in that area, and that's Titania, Protector of Argoth. She was a significant player on Dominaria during the Brothers' War, when her lands were sacked for supplies by both sides. She was presumed to have perished when Urza set off the Golgothian Silex, and her card is interesting to me because it does not self-enable, like, at all. Lands don't usually end up going into your graveyard without some help. And that makes her one of my more favorite commander-designed cards, because she requires a very specific strategy rather than just being generically good. Horde of Notions is another popular one among commander players, often chosen to lead a tribal deck. This wild herd of dreams, ideas, and fantasies comes from Lorwyn, and its five-color identity lets you take your deck in any direction you want. The art is great, and the card has a maximum otherworldly score. It shows what magic is capable of when it pushes the evocative side of elementals to their extreme on a plane that really embraces it. I'm sure some of you had the Horde down as your number one, but without a real story connection, it doesn't even make my top ten. Muldratha the Gravetide comes a bit closer, though, in 13th place. As Multani says in the flavor text, she was born in rot and ruin, and yet she bloomed, ultimately helping the crew of the new Weatherlight to defeat Yargle during their assault on Belzenlock's lair. So that brings us to Ashling the Pilgrim, who comes from the last era of storytelling to not revolve around Planeswalker cards, because they were only introduced in this same set. So that gave Ashling a lot of room to interact with the other major characters on Lorwyn, and she exemplified the plane's transition into Shadowmoor with her second card, but more on that one in a minute. This card doesn't really reflect Ashling's goals at this point in the story, though. She was searching for a greater elemental. The rising number of counters that eventually results in an outburst of damage does match the explosive nature of the Flamekin, though. Topping Ashling by a hair is Skullbriar, who remains one of the most expensive legendary elementals to acquire, so hopefully this one gets reprinted in Commander Legends later this year. We don't know a lot about Skullbriar, only that a necromancer and an elementalist met in an overgrown cemetery, planning to seal a pact that would grant them both immortality. Instead, they were merged into the game's most mechanically unique zombie elemental, which helps this card's reflection and extra scores. I just think it's a cool card. And that brings us to the top 10, which, if I had to do this over, maybe I'd just start here. I don't know. But you're still watching, so maybe I did it right. Anyway, in 10th place, thanks to an impressive legendary score, we have Multani, Morrow Sorcerer. There are many such Morrow Sorcerers on Dominaria, where it is believed every wood from large forest down to tiny grove is watched over by these elemental forces of nature. Multani is the protector of Yavimaya and was a major player in events on the plain. He fought the Phyrexians, and he even supplied the Hull Seed for the original Weatherlight. This particular card doesn't capture a lot of that mechanically, but it is still good enough to start our top 10, and it only gets better from here. Narrowly beating our first version of Multani is our first version of Omnath, that is, the Locus of Mana, as he appeared in World Wake. Omnath was originally sealed away underground as the people of Zendikar realized the danger in his wild and chaotic mana, but the ritual that kept him subdued was interrupted by the arrival of the Eldrazi. And so Omnath got out of his subterranean prison and became an immediate player favorite. His first version, which was just green, allowed you to break one of the game's key rules by allowing you to float mana across steps and phases. 
While this first version of Omnath is powerful and certainly otherworldly, he was more of a background presence in the story, which was overshadowed by the Eldrazi. Omnath would return more times than any other legendary elemental over the next several years, with his newest version taking my number eight spot. That's Omnath, Locus of Creation. Now, I don't know what impact he'll have on the ongoing Zendikar Rising story, but the fact that he has embraced a fourth color of mana and still uses that classic landfall ability means he'll always be a powerful elemental no matter what happens between Nyssa and Nahiri. Are you getting sick of hearing about Omnath yet? No? Great, because he's also in seventh place with Omnath, Locus of Rage. This was the Angry Jelly Bean's second appearance from Battle for Zendikar, where he was still mostly a background character because that story focused almost entirely on the formation of the Gatewatch. With a landfall trigger that created tokens the same size he was, and a death trigger that punished your opponent for trying to get the board back under control, this version of Omnath expressed a raw power only the primal fury of red and green working together can bring. By this point, it should be clear that Zendikar has hosted some of the most powerful creatures the game has ever seen, be it the towering Eldrazi or the elementals who rose to oppose them. Yarick the Desecrated is both sides of that coin, being an elemental created in the wake of the Eldrazi devastation of Zendikar. While Yarik doesn't appear in the story directly, their existence is significant, being caused by the Eldrazi. What really helps their score, though, is the perfect 10 for being otherworldly. This is a living piece of an established plane that's been twisted and corrupted by events happening on that plane. The abundant mana of Zendikar allows it to double the effectiveness of your creatures entering the battlefield, and the lifelink and death touch combo really captures the unending quest to sap the life out of everything around it. Overall, a very powerful elemental. Still not good enough to make my top five. No, for that, we have to go back to Dominaria and find the Morrow Sorcerer for Llanowar, Malamo. From fighting against the Phyrexians to supplying Joyra with the Hull Seed for the new Weatherlight, Malamo has been involved in stories on Dominaria for centuries. His card is deceptively straightforward. He grows in power with the number of lands you control, and then will trample over whatever defenses your opponent can muster. That's about as green as you can get, and I am giving him some extra points for flavor text that is just a self-quote. You don't see those very often. In fourth place, we get our fourth version of Omnath with Locus of the Royal. I think this three-color version of Omnath has just the right number of stones in his Infinity Gauntlet. He's moved away from caring about mana to caring more about other elementals, but he still has that classic landfall trigger that has become synonymous with his home plane of Zendikar. For as powerful as this version of Omnath is, most of his strength comes from synergy with other elementals. And to make it to the top of my list, you have to be strong enough to stand on your own. So with the bronze medal and an impressive lore score of 32 points, we find Ashling the Extinguisher. At the height of her story powers, she was one of the most fearsome creatures on the plane, laying waste to whole areas of Shadowmoor before being subdued by an entire team of other legends. Her card captures this relentless force of destruction by forcing your opponents to sacrifice their best creatures again and again. It is brutal. Edging out Ashling for the silver medal, we have Multani Yavamaya's avatar. His return in Dominaria showed he was still a powerful guardian of the plane, but it took a calming touch from Chandra, of all people, to help him rebuild his physical form, which had been destroyed during the Mending some 60 years prior. As I said in my video on A History of Elementals, Ryan Yi is my favorite artist working in the game today, and I love how this version of Multani looks a little more frail and spindly than his previous, but still radiates natural power. The card itself has a strong connection to lands and allows you to experience your own 
we are Groot moment when you bring Multani back to life after replanting a few of your own trees. Add in reach and trample and power and toughness that directly relate to your connection to lands both living and dead, and you have a legendary elemental worthy of second place. So who could possibly top that? Well, how about one of the most in-demand cards from Zendikar Rising? Ashaya, Soul of the Wild, takes first place in my Legendary Elementals lore rankings, with nearly perfect scores in all categories. As a piece of Zendikar's own world soul, Ashaya is the personal elemental of the Planeswalker Nyssa. You've been able to summon a token version of Ashaya since Magic Origins, but now with Zendikar Rising, she gets her own full card, and it is one of the best in the set. Power and toughness equal to the number of lands you control? Yeah, we've seen that on other legendary elementals, but they all cost six mana or more. Ashaya is only five. And she turns all of your non-token creatures into forests, which means they are lands, which means they also increase her power and toughness. So she gives you access to insane amounts of mana, and she blanks all of your opponent's cards that work on non-land permanence. She's powerful in the story, fighting the Eldrazi alongside Nyssa in the battle for Zendikar, and she's a powerful card. You don't even have to make your deck do anything special to take advantage of her. The only weakness, if you can call it that, is that I don't know what impact she'll have on the story for Zendikar Rising as of writing this, but she's already done so much alongside Nyssa, it almost doesn't matter. Ashaya has already planted herself as the most powerful legendary elemental the game has ever seen. But that's just like my opinion, man. So do you agree or disagree? Let me know down in the comments and then make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the great stories you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. We'll see you.